Hello, beautiful human. I'm Zach. That's Dan. Yo. Smosh is on the way real quick. Want to tell you that uh, if you want to change the way you sleep forever beyond sleep, try the Vibersonic. It's my favorite mattress. It's changed my life. Link in the description below. They're going to be giving away free mattresses too. Just sign up and free mattresses could be coming at you. Don't sleep on this offer. Uh, hi, beautiful human. I'm Zach. Uh, uh, that's Dan. And we welcome to the studio for the first time ever. <laughs> Anthony and uh, Ian, this is Smosh. Hi. Hey. hey. Hello. Hey. Woo. We, woo. Yeah, I just Hello. jump in. I'm sorry. Uh, that's no, all that's good. good. Yeah. Yeah. I don't I like that. small talk. I, I mean, I do like I do like small talk, but I'm a long talk guy. You know? Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, skip to the goods. Yeah, I don't want to waste anything. Yeah. And uh, it's an honor that you guys are here. Like, why the fuck are you here doing our show? Like, I'm I not feel, sure. Yeah, right? <laughs> no, I genuinely- Do you want to do our show? I would, I would give a limb. Um, <laughs> g- genuinely, like, I'm looking at two people that have laid the groundwork for so much of what the internet does today, but also two people that created the original internet dream- for so many, <laughs> and it's really wild to think about. And there's very few people, but also a ton of people, if this makes any sense, <laughs> that have been doing this on the internet for as long as you have. Mm. I went back and I watched videos from the very, 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 very beginning, 17 years oh, ago God. plus. Yeah. Nice. Really special stuff, though. <laughs> it's It's something. Yeah, it's interesting. That old stuff is something, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so strange looking back at it, and it, it almost feels like just like home video footage, you know? Do you remember the moment where it changed, though, from home video footage to something that needed to be thought about from a quality first perspective? Or not not quality first, but at least keeping quality in mind at all throughout the process? I mean, I think I think because our content started off with like the worst possible equipment, our focus was always on improving the quality. So like we started with this like piece of crap, like uh twenty dollar webcam that that Anthony's dad like lent him. So yeah. we we were constrained within like a five foot radius uh from Anthony's oh, yeah. computer because it was wired. Mm-hmm. So um you know, our first objective was to uh, get a camera so that we could actually leave his bedroom. Um, and then it became like, okay, like, let's make sure the sound gets better. Let's make sure the video gets better. Like, the, the handy cam that we bought, you know, this is like in the days of DV tapes. So uh, the, the microphone's on board the camera. So when you're rolling, you're hearing the tape whirring. So it's like, in the background the whole time. So we were like, this this sucks. So like I think we were always on like a mission to like improve the quality. Yeah, and I think one of the uh, I think it was actually a blessing that we had such limitations at the beginning. Like even being constrained to my desk and not really being able to move at all. I think it actually helped us to focus on the the creative behind it. I feel like there's so many possibilities now. You you can make literally anything anywhere at any time. And I think mm-hmm. because we had those limitations, we were able to really hone in on what it was that we wanted to do. And then I think because we started there and then we started expanding after that, we we were kind of able to focus on the creative first always. It's really an interesting thought, right? Because you yeah. didn't have a plethora of resources instantly. And now right. with the democratization of content and the fact that you can have a movie studio in your palm of your hand, you, you're not limited at all. You actually have the ability to do anything and everything to a point where it is overwhelming. Yeah. yeah. And, it's but, like decision fatigue, you know? 100%, but also like by being so limited, you understand what you do great. Right. And mm. understand what you bring to the Internet or to the situation that maybe nobody else can. And you understand what needs to be exploited or at least expanded upon as you move forward. Yeah. I find like I mean, I want to know how you define what, what you did something that I didn't understand until I got fully briefed. Right. <laughs> and we brief and, you know, you interview people. Yeah. You started hosting your own videos on the smosh dot com and your video organically makes its way to YouTube. Mm-hmm. And that's how you realize that you don't need to pay for video hosting. Mm-hmm. You can get it for free and create a whole video platform because really you, you ended up having to spend a lot of money to keep this going, which ends up becoming a through line throughout your entire history, which is <laughs> you fund this shit on your own, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which I totally understand and I get. Where do you learn about video hosting number like like even coding? Like how did you understand that you could build a website like this and 
Also, what did you think of YouTube at first? Yeah, I mean, I was I was a really big computer nerd, always into tech. Um, I'll say frequently that I think the reason, because I've, I've kind of tried to go back and figure out why it was that I was so obsessed with this computer in my room, and I think it was because I felt like I had very limited resources in my life. My family didn't have much money. It was kind of like a broken home type situation. But the computer, whenever I, I'd walk past my room and i see this computer in there that my dad had purchased me, I'd be like, that is infinite possibilities. I could do anything there. There are absolutely no limitations. The only limit is something that I could figure out in my head. So I would spend every single waking moment that I could, you know, I would abandon my homework and, and, and as much as I could, I would focus on what can I do with this computer. And that's when I started, I just, I, I was really into video games when I was younger. I wanted to learn how to code video games. I was like, I started learning how to code like flash animations and, and games and things like that. And then I, uh, got really obsessed with just the way that websites worked. And then I wanted to create my own. I created like a, a fan page for this game, Age of Empires. And I learned how to make a website there. And then I wanted to make my own website. Um, and then in, this was 2002. And uh, mm -hmm. my group of friends, including Ian, um, we had this little inside joke because one of our friends mispronounced Mosh Pit, said Smosh. And I, I made this website um, that I, I wanted my group of friends to be able to hang out, talk to each other after school um, and not just on instant messenger, but have like a forum. So I made this website and yeah, that's when we, Ian and I organically just started making these videos a few years later and, and posting them on MySpace. Yeah. yeah well, actually they, they were hosted on smosh.com yeah, and that's yeah. the difference is that they were hosted <laughs> on smosh.com, but they were posted on MySpace. So MySpace was basically the distributor, but we were paying for the hosting. Uh, yeah. And as you said, yeah, it costs money. And the reason that, we even discovered YouTube was because someone had taken that video and uploaded it to YouTube. And the reason that I was excited about using YouTube in the first place wasn't even because I knew, because there was no audience there really. It was a very, very small community that was on there. It was because I didn't have to pay for the, yeah. the hosting <laughs> yeah, for people just, to watch the video. It was just a platform so that we didn't have to pay for hosting. And that was that was the initial reason for going on there. And then once we started pushing people from from like MySpace to go watch it on YouTube, YouTube started gaining traction just through like press and stuff. And we happened to be there as people started to like find out about this like YouTube thing. Yeah. And it was really cool that there were comments, you know, that was the only platform, the only place that I'd seen where there were comments attached to a video directly mm. next to it feedback. Yeah. 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 And, and encouragement and, and fans and all these things that we had never heard of uh, you know being attached to videos yeah before. well i mean we had like because we we did like flash animation stuff so there there was this site called newgrounds mm -hmm. which was kind of like pre youtube and it was all cartoons that people like it was user generated content um so i feel like we had like some understanding of like That's true, yeah. how to like how to use youtube because we had used newgrounds before mm. Mm -hmm. Um, and they, you could build a small community on there as well. That's okay. true. Yeah. Hey, beautiful human. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. If you treat your gut right, everything in your life will get a little bit better. Everything. I, I, I mean that seriously. My gut was not in a good place. And then I started drinking this thing called AG1 and everything fell into place. I had more energy, wasn't feeling nearly as sluggish. I had the right amount of focus. I just didn't feel bleh. I felt, wow. Seriously, so much in your life is connected to your gut, the way you feel, your immune system, the way you operate in a day. So, yeah, it's helped with my daily flow. And now I've added AG1 to my daily flow. I take it every morning to replace my vitamins, and I feel good. If you want to try it out, just go to drinkag1.com slash zaxang to try it out. And if you use that little website, we'll hook you up with a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2. I haven't tried that one yet, but we'll also hook you up with five free travel packs of AG1. So, come on. Your gut needs you. Are you listening to your gut? Because it's saying, drink AG1. Drinkag1.com slash Zach Try it out and let me know what you think. What fuels your desire, though, to code and build things on the internet that take you away from your reality? Is it, <laughs> is it what was going on at home? Because... I had no idea, but your mom's an agoraphobe. Yes, yes. And that, as painful as it is for her, it's equally as painful for everybody around her. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You have to change the way you live. Yeah, it was rough. You know, I thought that I was going to be living the same lifestyle as her. Um, for some reason, I saw every everything in my life leading toward me 
also ending up at that in that position for some reason. So when I did see my computer as this gateway to, to kind of infinite resources, I felt like I needed to, to fully dive into that and somehow take advantage of that. An ability to build your own, right? Like to create whatever, I mean, you, create you can your build own anything. World. It's digital. It's, yeah. it's, it's strange. You know, I, I used to, I remember I used to ponder on this idea that, um, you know, especially once we started making money on this thing, I was like, I am somehow generating money from, from nothing, you know, from like invisible data and it's becoming a tangible resource. And that was such a, a strange concept to me. Do you see that data as people? Oh yeah, for sure. But I'm talking about the data that we are distributing ourselves, but yeah, it definitely, um, people, but I will say it is strange when you see numbers on a screen and then it's, it's so different when you see people in person that are, uh, you know, fans of your content mm -hmm. versus numbers and views and comments and things like that. It doesn't, it almost doesn't seem like, you know, it's real, but it doesn't quite feel entirely real until you're like in a room with yeah. With and and like when the viewer base was like smaller, it was so funny because we we would respond to like every person. <laughs> yeah. Like every person that sent that like posted a comment, we would like respond to them. Every, every person, email. Every person that sent us an email or or like a DM, we'd be like, Thanks so much, blah, blah, blah. And would like have these conversations and I feel like, you know, eventually it just like it was like, Oh my God, like we can't do this anymore. It's just overwhelming <laughs> yeah. to communicate with everyone. Yeah, it's wild. Yeah, but it also shows impact, and it, it to under like, yes, to drown in feedback to also also means to have real impact on human beings, and to not say that your content is meaningful. I don't think the amount of people it hits equals meaningful, right? People make mm. content every day that has meaning and power and impact that just hasn't risen to the point where it touches people yet. For and sure, it could be on its way. Yeah. Um. But it is overwhelming and it does change what you do, right? And how you do it because something that maybe was just for the two of you and your friends becomes something so much larger. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's uh, a, a gift and a curse in some ways, you know, because totally. in the beginning, Ian and I got started kind of capturing the fun that we had together and then seeing what it would be like if we showed other people this kind of fun that, that we were having on our own. Um, and then eventually it evolves to this place where you can't help but kind of think about the way that it's being perceived. And in those earliest days, because we didn't know there were there was anyone that was even going to see it, we didn't really think about the way it was being perceived. We were just making stuff <laughs> for us. You know? Yeah, yeah. And just also just like forming our sort of like personalities online. It's just it's just funny to like look back at those old videos and and see how different we were and like. I, I mean, it's so funny. Like I was so like, I don't know if like inarticulate's the right word for it, <laughs> but like, I was like, I was such a mumbler. Like when we first got started, like all of our old videos, I was like, uh, yeah, maybe I'll do that. <laughs> and like, it's just so funny that like, I've just, I feel like I've changed so much, probably like partially as a result of seeing myself yeah. online so much and, and, you know, kind of critiquing my own sort of like performance and how I, how I come off. Sometimes I wonder what, what I would be like, but I guess what we both would be like if we didn't have that ability to, or we weren't forced to constantly perceive ourselves by watching the yeah. videos, editing the videos, seeing the comments, just it's a lot of consumption of you. It's, it's yeah. all, it completely changes. I, th I think it completely changes the way that you interact with the world and perceive yourself. It's just constantly Definitely. seeing yourself and interacting with content of yourself and people commenting on that content. It's, it's wild. I mean, I think that's something that like probably you and I have both kind of like had to sort of ponder over, you know, the last several years of like the identity of us as Smosh, you know, because you left Smosh like seven years ago. Mm -hmm. And and, you know, I, I've always kind of like wondered like, oh, if this like Smosh things Smosh thing ends like that will never stop people from like coming up to me and being like Smosh. Mm -hmm. And then like even before you got back into Smosh, like you and I went out to dinner with my parents in L.A. And like the dude was like Smosh. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, yeah, yeah kind of like, mm -hmm. yeah, sort of. And that was but before Anthony's we were done. ever even talking about buying it back. So it was yeah, it was uh, it was strange to kind of know that we would 
forever be known as something and that person always had an image of who we are and that's one thing that that uh strikes me as well is i mean first of all we fell into this we didn't know this was going to happen we had no one to learn from we were doing a lot of things that had never been done before is that how you define pioneer um I imagine a pickaxe. Yeah. <laughs> I imagine pan. a few people dying of dysentery. Yeah. 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 No, uh, I mean, I think, I, yeah, we definitely were. I, I think for me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, I'm sure we were mal- malnourished to some degree at the <laughs> yeah. beginning, but, uh, no, uh, but they, just eating Taco Bell all the time. But that is a part of, by the way, T, uh, <laughs> raise me, still live on it. Uh, only reason I survive. Um, there is something that, like, when you have nobody else to look towards or to look at as some sort of parallel or an example or somebody to follow because you truly are paving new ground. And there is a moment, though, where something that you go to to rid yourself of anxiety turns into something that actually induces anxiety. <laughs> that's that's true. Yeah, it, it was it was an outlet for us to kind of creatively express ourselves and in some way, I guess, relieve or distract from some of that anxiety and then yeah there's there's that pressure there's do you remember the moment um i mean was it in 2009 (laughs) it's strange because there was it was all uphill growth and it required so much of our time i don't know if it required so much of our time but i just couldn't help but put every single waking moment into it because it felt like a once in a lifetime opportunity it felt like mm-hmm. if we pass this up the moment would be gone and we would no longer be able to attempt to do this yeah. ever again yeah so, there's there's definitely like a pressure of like we we watched our peers kind of you know maybe maybe they hit big and then they got like a pilot or something they left the platform to do the pilot the pilot didn't get packed get didn't get picked back up they go back to their channel and it's not the same mm-hmm. so like we always kind of had that fear of like if we like lit up for like a second like this might we might not be able to come back to it it felt very fragile and i think that's when the anxiety about it started is because we we really loved what we were doing and we really loved this the trajectory that we were we were on because we started to have all these big ideas and dreams about what Smosh could become, but then it feels so fragile at the same time. And there's no stability in YouTube's future, the internet's future and where technology is even going. Yeah, because you hit this crossroads, right? Where like, you, you, and I'm assuming the trajectory keeps moving, right? Mm. The goalpost continues to move, but you want to do bigger things that are creative, but those also pose the biggest risk, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe the biggest financial risk, maybe the biggest risk to your audience and not being what your audience wants, even though this is creatively what you're driven to. Mm-hmm. Was there a moment that you think of in particular where you're like, I need to make this video, but like maybe it's not going to hit the way it should, but I needed to make it. Or did you not even have those discussions? Were you solely looking at things through a lens of what did your audience want and desire? I think, I think we were looking at it under such a, zoomed in microscope that it was difficult to even zoom out and start looking at any big picture type stuff. It was really for so long. It was really like video to video to video to video. It was, I don't, I don't think risk was, was much of a thing we discussed. It was, it was more like opportunities, like, like the, the opportunity of, you know, creating smosh the movie, like it wasn't really that much of a of a risk to us. It was like it was like okay, this is going to be a challenge, a really cool opportunity. It's going to take a lot of a lot of our time away from other things, but it's like when are we going to get this opportunity again? And I think I think we we always just kind of like jump from opportunity to opportunity every time something came up, and not everything panned out well. You know, we had this like. Uh, this like company reached out to us. They're like, we want to make a Smosh magazine. And we were like, okay. And yeah. we did that for like two issues and it was like, okay, this doesn't make sense. The thing was, there was no way to know if there was something that was worth our time or yeah. not. Well, you gotta kind of take of all it. of it and, and learn. And we, right? had the, and we had the parent company too that was kind of impressing on us that we needed to do this stuff. Money. Yeah. 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 I mean, we didn't even get into how we sold Smosh in 2011. And oh, that, that. that's where a lot of things changed because it was kind of handing it off to uh, a parent company who was able to to make decisions. They were funding all the stuff at that point, mm-hmm. which took a lot of the uh, financial risk 
off of our plates and we right. were able to focus entirely on the creative, which was great. But then there were, you know, outside voices kind of poking in there. Super hard. That's like, the, I, like I, I do not envy that position as I've been there. And I've been on both sides as I like really did detailed dive into your history and really understood. I relate very deeply. Uh, we owned everything. We had an independent show. We in in the world of radio, we were on FM radio, right? And yeah. I'm not going to bore you with the education of it, but like we grew from zero radio stations to about 90 all over mm. North America, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And we were on every night, six days a week, whatever. We then sold the show essentially. And it's been a bitch and a half to get back. And now we have parts of it back and we've mm -hmm. regained our freedom in a bunch of different ways. But the feeling of giving somebody everything and then all of a sudden having somebody pull the fucking plug on you yeah. mm -hmm. is the worst feeling imaginable when it is your livelihood. And I've been doing this show for 17 years. Right okay. around the same time yeah, you guys yeah. are doing this. Yeah. yeah. As your first video came like 17 years and change. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. So I, I, I understand very, very, very much the idea of putting everything one has both personally and professionally and really every fiber of one's personal and physical being into something Yeah. to then give it to somebody else. And then for that person with no notice whatsoever fucking ever to just abruptly pull the plug on you. Yeah. Well, they pulled the plug on themselves, but, but yeah. in turn, <laughs> you came with it, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, yes, we yeah. did. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you were a byproduct of larger, faulty, shitty decisions. Yes. And in that moment, like, I can't, it, it's, it's like you're, it's like you're holding yourself, your physical self and somebody else has everything. Like, you have no control over your physical self. Yeah. If I that think, makes sense. Yeah, definitely. And I think, I think that's the big lesson for me was, was ownership of IP. Uh, when, when Defy Media, who was our parent company, went out of business, uh, Smosh was essentially sold to the highest bidder. And I was involved in that process of trying to find a suitable partner. Yeah, I already uh, did Smosh by that point. So yeah. yeah. So yeah. Ian was taking it on. <laughs> and, and well, you bail, but do you see this coming? Um, a little bit just because of the 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 way that things the, the decisions that were being made and things just didn't really seem to to line up with the creative. It seemed like it was all about appeasing the investors. And to me, that was kind of a big reason why I bailed. So I didn't exactly see it coming, but things just didn't look good. And then it was a year later that that all happened. And then Ian was kind of, because he stayed with Smosh, left to kind of pick up. In a relationship yeah. with Defy that only comes after a Disney executive reaches out to you, right? Right. Well, well he yeah. wasn't working at Disney at the time. Like, he, yeah, he was, he was a former Disney executive. Mm -hmm. He agreed to be essentially our business manager. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had actually signed on to a uh, a separate company. They had a they had a percentage of Smosh, and they were they were helping with us helping us with like our back end stuff, like website development. And then he helped us then migrate over to Defy, where he mm -hmm. also takes an executive role over yeah. there, right, right. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. also is your business manager. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Seems a little seedy. There's there's some strange stuff, but I mean. I mean, I, he, he doesn't become, he became our president. Got it. Yeah. yeah. So this is. What, what was their vision for Smosh that you guys didn't agree with or didn't see eye to eye with? I mean, the, I, oh, go ahead. Ian. Well, I think, I think we, we all had this vision of our goal was to turn Smosh into sort of like the Saturday night live of the internet in terms of being a place for comedians to want to come to us and then like we would foster them grow a cast make more funny stuff and then have those people go off into the world and make great things and then maybe we would have a part of that cool um i think that obviously when when that goes one thing we didn't think about which is because there was no precedent set for this is when you sell your company to a media company that is you know responsible for quarterly financials, that kind of stuff. They want to see immediate results. Mm -hmm. So when we started get, uh, hi uh, hiring on a cast, our our take was like, we got to slowly integrate these people. We got to get the audience like used to them, like to accept them because change on YouTube is very scary for an audience. Uh, Defy's response is, you know, take these five people that you've decided on and start putting them in everything. <laughs> And mm -hmm. and obviously the audience flipped out 
Um, and, and I think we probably had a decent amount of attrition from that move. Um, eventually people came to, came to love the cast because they're all really funny, really talented people, but there was definitely attrition there. And if we would have had, if we would have had the call, like we would have said, like, let's just slowly integrate these people. Yeah, that was one aspect of it. And another big part of it was I feel like the the higher ups who kind of made a lot of decisions regarding what where Smosh could or couldn't go. They thought Smosh was literally for 12 year olds. Like mm. as as yeah. Ian and I were, you know, when we started, we were 17, 18. But as we were in our mid 20s, we felt like the content could could grow with us and it just expand beyond that. And they thought that the content was literally for, for 10, 11, 12 year olds. Yeah. There's definitely like a disconnect with, with people's understanding of like who Smosh's audience is like we're 12 year olds watching Smosh. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. But it was not content made for 12 year olds, no. nor was it just 12, 12 year olds that were watching it. But I think that you have a lot of people that are coming from old media that only understand things in like demographic ranges and being mm -hmm. like, okay, wait, so are you Nickelodeon or are you Disney yeah, you or are you MTV? Put it in the I box. don't understand. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we're not any of those things. We're like, we're smosh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but again, this is a part of being trailblazers, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is a, like you have to fuck up and find out. Yeah. And then you also have to share those lessons with other people. What sucks is like, Nobody was there before you, but also that's a blessing. It's a blessing and a curse. Mm. Yeah. I mean, if we weren't the first to do a lot of these things, I don't think that we would be here because there would be there's, totally. the, the, ever, it's so oversaturated right now. Like it's so hard to get a footing and to build something from the ground up now. Definitely. Do you really, I mean, the internet, do you think is maybe too democratized? <laughs> I, 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 I think the, I'd say it's, it's just homogenized a little bit. Like I feel like in order to succeed, you have to create a certain product for a lot mm, of yeah. for a lot of creators. And I think that when we started, there was no such thing as an algorithm. There was no such thing as like, oh, like retention rate and stuff. It's like, no, you're like you're like a weirdo and you're making like <laughs> silly videos. Or vlogs or whatever. And it was kind of, do, do people like this and want to share it with their friends or not? And yeah. that's, that's really all that it boiled down to. So I think, like, I, I'm I'm glad we, like, came up when we did because we were just allowed to make what we what we wanted to make and, and what was funny to us. But, like, if we were to start now, like, yeah, I mean, I would be looking at, like, you know, all the top creators and being like, okay, like, I guess I got to, like, try every... Uh, Denny's in America <laughs> to true. get some views on this. Yeah, and then you're looking at stats and you're lo you're thinking about the algorithm and I think that we were, if I think that the reason that we are, are even able to now say almost 18 years later that we've created something we've and we've grown it into some whatever it is today, this, this much, much bigger thing today, is because we were able to slowly try all these little tiny things and just kind of organically, you know, we started just making one video whenever we felt like it here or there, then it just became this slow thing that built. But it feels like if you want to get in now and turn it into something like you have to hit the ground running and you can't step up from the, mo the momentum, you have to understand the algorithm and what audiences want. And, and it's just such this it's different thing. It's but so complicated. Something changes in you in 2009 and you write that letter where you see this going from fun to a job, essentially. Are any of what you just described feelings that you had back then? Uh, what, what is it that you're referring to in 2009? Didn't you write a letter uh, in regards to when you felt like the relationship between the two of you? Oh, oh, oh you mean, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. I wrote this. This You wrote an open letter. Ye, uh, and, yeah, that was just for myself. Oh, and then the, I angry, read it the angry journal? My, my angry journal entry, entry? that I read. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, I did yeah. mention, I mentioned in 2009 that it felt like <laughs> something between us had changed because something between Ian and I had had kind of become more of a working relationship. Yeah. Mm. And I think that really just boils down to the fact that we were roommates, that we had just moved in together about a year prior, and it felt like we were putting all of our work into, all of our time into working together. So when we were done working, 
we wouldn't just hang out because we had just been together the entire day, you know? So there was no time for us to hang out as friends and to grow together as individuals. We were only really this duo, this unit that would work together. And then once we were done, ah, finally get a moment to, to relax, but it would be alone because we'd already spent all of our time together. So I'd say that's, mm -hmm. there was a shift around 2009 where we were working so damn much that when we were done, we wanted to just have our time alone and we never connected beyond that. Which I understand that a relationship evolving, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But also realizing that you're seeing a friend go from a friend to business partner. Yeah. A creative partner. Yeah. yeah. But I feel like I didn't really see it at the time, you know? No, was... no. And, and I mean, like we, we worked together so well as creative partners and, and that felt so lucky. And we were, we were always laughing together, making stuff. So when we were working, it felt like we were hanging out. Yeah. And, but we never like had we never had like you know like deep or honest conversations with each other. It was always it, it became this relationship where it was always just shallow uh, in terms of just making each other laugh and and working together. Yeah, it wasn't really we weren't really having those deeper difficult conversations totally. that friends have as they as as you need to have as you grow yeah. from you know being friends as teenagers into adults going into your twenties. You know, your energy shifts as a unit into building something and yeah I, I, that is hard though because it is like it you, you are losing a friend to gain a business partner and creative right. partner yeah but i think we also were in denial mm -hmm. like we're like no we're great friends and like totally. so much of our brand was about being friends. best friends like you yeah. know like our like the sort of motto that that smosh always had was friendship always wins mm -hmm. so people always knew us as the best friends so like when Anthony left Smosh, like the main question that we got from like fans was like, are you guys still friends? Are you guys still hanging out? And like, we always would kind of like, you know, like dodge the question or be like, you know, we're both busy. We're both working on our own things, which is true. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I mean, for, for a good few years, like we didn't really talk that much. Like we, we saw each other a few times. Um, but then, I think that space is what allowed us to grow separately. And then when we reconnected, we were able to like have these sort of honest conversations with each mm -hmm. other and kind of like build a new adult friendship. Mm -hmm. That sounds sexual. But, <laughs> but yeah. yeah. Not so, yeah. <laughs> How many years did you really need apart? Uh, so it was six years after me leaving Smosh to, to us announcing that we repurchased, but I think it was about four and a half or five years that mm -hmm. we didn't really see each other. We would say hi. Yeah. We would say happy birthday. But beyond that, not so much. Uh, and then we started hanging out, reconnecting in a way that felt like it felt like we were still the friends that we always were. But yet, I think because we had spent so much time apart, we both didn't kind of have this maybe a little bit of resentment. And a little bit of this like awkward feeling of like, oh, I can't, I can't talk about that thing. You know, like it felt mm -hmm. like everything was on the table again. It felt like it was okay to talk about anything. And I think that's where we really did start to reconnect and realize that we were still the friends that we had always been. And to like have a relationship that was completely removed from business. That's true. Yeah. Like, we needed to reestablish that. Yeah. How did so you guys much. reconnect? Like, who reached out to who? Or did you guys, like, sit down one day together? Uh, a friend of mine, uh, I was talking to her about Anthony, and she was like, you should reach out to him. <laughs> like, <laughs> what are you doing? Like, what were you saying to her about me? Like, I, I don't oh, know. Oh, this like, old friend of mine. <laughs> well, because I was, like, telling her about, I was telling her about Smosh and, and you know, talking about you. And, and, and yeah, I think she, like, kind of, like, saw, like, you know, there's still, like, I still, you know, I spoke fondly of you and everything. Mm. So she was like, you, you, you should like get back together with them or whatever. <laughs> everything so. sounds like a relationship. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you guys have been friends since the sixth grade. Yeah. 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 A teacher is responsible for this partnership. Oh yeah. yeah that's right. true. Science yeah, yeah. project. Yeah. The sixth yeah. grade science mm -hmm. teacher. Dude, the universe is fucking crazy. It's very weird. It's very strange when you just kind of, uh, when you go with it, I think, when you fight against what the universe is giving you, that's when, uh, yeah, that's when you're not able to kind of 
take where it's where it's leading you. And I, it's it's interesting, you know, not to get spiritual here, but I feel oh, like please. every everything has kind of been leading to this to to the moment that we're in now. Uh, Ian and I often say that you know we everything needed to happen exactly as it did in order for us to be where yeah. we are now with Smosh in this in this 100%. good place. One hundred percent. Even even between you know all just all the things that. In the past, I would have said, oh, I regret doing that. I wished I didn't do that. I wish we didn't sell because this happened. And then uh, I wish that I would have, I mean, everything needed to happen. Even even Ian and my falling out, you know, for lack of a better term, totally. or it, it all needed to happen exactly as it did, our time apart, mm-hmm. everything. It's true. Like, none of this would be today if any of that didn't happen. Like, it, yeah. it, it's weird to think about. Like, it is... Shitty shit, like rough roads, terrible stuff, hurts mm-hmm. you in the moment, probably the most ever. Can't, I can't understand it, but also can't imagine it because it hits everybody different. But ultimately, you you sit on the most knowledge and understanding. And I'm assuming you're applying that every day as you recreate or not recreate, breathe new life into something that you've built for the last 17 years. Yeah, yeah. I feel like if we didn't go through everything we went through, we wouldn't be approaching this in the way that we are now. And I think because of that, we're able to approach it from a much with a yeah, with a much wiser perspective. Um, you know, we're able to maintain healthier lives, healthier relationships with people in our lives. I feel like we sacrificed or at least I I know I personally sacrificed my relationships with pretty much everyone in my life. Even even Ian when you really look at it because it just became all about getting the work done. And then by the time I was done in any given day, I was so burnt out that I just wanted to, to melt into my couch and do nothing until the cycle repeated the next day. I get it. And you kind of crave the cycle to repeat almost. I think, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I you're mean, a bit of a workaholic. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, well, I'm not. <laughs> I, I would escape my emotions by working because – when I'm when I'm working, I'm not thinking about my emotions. So that's that's where the workaholicism comes in. And I think a lot of people praise the idea of being a workaholic because it's so grind set, so bro. Got it. Got to get in there, and you gotta yeah, put put one hundred percent, one hundred ten percent of yourself in there always. But I think what it really is doing is it's allowing you to escape emotions that you have. But I can make the case that so much of your work is infused with the emotions you harbor. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, uh, I mean, even now looking at a lot of the sketches that we write, I'm seeing uh, a lot of mirroring to experiences that we've had, um, emotions that we've been holding on to. Like there's there's ways that it presents itself through the art, for lack of a better term. It's it, it finds itself into what we're creating constantly. Yeah, I remember I remember when you when you first left Smosh. Uh, we we talked about this before, but <laughs> when he first left Smosh and he started creating sketches on his own, I'd say like what was it, like three of the six first videos you you made mm-hmm. ended with you crying in a bathtub. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I, someone commented, they're like, they're like, wow, I love how every video you're crying in a bathtub, and I was like, oh shit, yeah. oh shit, what does this really mean? Oh no, I'm not in a good place. Yeah, it was hard for me to to realize the place I was in. And I, I think it would come out in my work. So how do you operate the channel now? Like the team is how many people, how often do you guys work? Can you like just break down the process for me? Yeah. We're, we're about 38 employees. Um, we have, uh, three, three channels that we, that we operate. So the Smosh main channel is the sketches. That's what Anthony and I are most like largely involved in. Then we have the pit channel, which is unscripted comedy. Um, which we appear in, we kind of we kind of sit in on like the pitch meetings and talk about concepts. But we've cultivated a really good team there that that handles a lot of that and really great cast members. As really well. good cast members, and then and then we have a games channel as well. So there's somebody that manages that, um, and it's you know Sweet. it's people that have sort of come up through Smosh over over many years and have grown to now take ownership of these of these sort of like verticals in Smosh. And for Anthony and I, like our focus right now is the main channel and, and creating sketch comedy. Um, mm-hmm. Well, I we also like, oversee yeah. everything and we're kind of guiding the ship, but we have really, really great people working, as Ian said, on, on all these things. And we get to kind of uh, 
as we as we guide them, we're able to then give them free reign to to do what they feel is right. Um, and then also you forgot to mention Smosh Cast. So yeah, we have a couple other other oh, yeah. channels as <laughs> we have well. A podcast channel, of course. Um, but yeah, and we're we're working out of um, a pretty large uh, studio space with with a few office units and and sound stages uh, where we shoot all these out of. And then we have uh, a studio space that I shoot my interviews out of that we we turned the uh, the lower part of this house and uh, uh, our set for our sketches as well. What we, we, what we consider like the smosh house that, yeah. the, that our, you know, fictional selves live in that a lot of the sketches kind of like take place in. So mm-hmm. it, it, I was, th- I've been thinking about it th- over this past week. Like it really does feel like we're in this new iteration of smosh and, and one that I'm like really proud of. And I feel like I, I feel like, so confident about it and 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 you know people ask me like how things have been and i say like it's i feel like the work has increased but the work feels more purposeful Mm -hmm. like i have people that i could that i know i can lean on that are accountable for things that i can't be accountable for um and it's a really great team and i'm really really proud of everyone and uh yeah it's it's i think it's a really really cool moment for us and yeah and i think yeah. the best part of it all is that we're completely independent right now it's awesome so you know we spent so many years being i mean when we started we were independent and i think it was we we're kind of having the times of our lives with with what we were doing and then it, it it did evolve into a place where we were kind of having other people make decisions for us and it kind of felt like we had no purpose we didn't like have a big vision for where we were going we were just wherever you want us to, to go, I guess this is kind of where we're going now. We'll try a little bit of everything. And now we're back in this place being independent and being able to completely zoom out with really big ideas and knowing we get to know that the decisions that we're making now are leading to much bigger ideas that we have. And also everything you're doing on your own is only because of what you've been able to learn along the way, right? Like I very much relate to just wanting to create content and letting somebody else handle the business side Mm -hmm. of it and getting people paid and handling staffing and all that kind of shit. But the reality is like in the moment I look at that and I go like, you know, yeah, I made a mistake. Like hindsight is 20. Do you feel like you made a mistake? I mean, yeah, yeah. I think, well, everything is done for a reason. I think I wasted time. So right. to say that I made a mistake, no, I, I I was in that situation. I was able to then learn and gather how to properly operate a business on my own to the mm-hmm. point where we, we, we now we operate the way you guys operate, like as a freestanding thing and a team that's ours. And we just we do our own P&L and our own, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. pay stuff and insurance mm-hmm. and shit. Um, but yeah, I, but I was able to learn all of that. It, I, I just, I, I honestly wish I would have trusted myself because I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I knew that I could do it, but I also doubted it. Did like, you have yeah. those fears coming up with like, can I do this on my own? Totally. That, yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Because it was like, yeah. I knew I needed to scale and grow. And even when we were moving from like a traditional radio company to doing our own thing and then eventually making our way over to Amazon, you know, we had a team of people and we had existing infrastructure and we knew we needed things to get the job done at the quality that we had been operating at, at that point for the last like 13 years. So yeah, it, 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 I doubted my own ability to handle the operation side of that. Mm-hmm. And I ended up just going with, with whoever offered that at whatever deal it was. That's kind of yeah. where, where we were at. But I feel like sometimes you just got to frick around and find out. <laughs> that's I don't it. know if I could say. You it, did. But... I said fuck around. You okay. fuck, go ahead. Yeah. Fuck around and find out. But, but that's when that's you got to fuck around and find out because you have nobody else to look to who's fucked right. around and found out mm-hmm. first. Yeah. And then you're fucking around and found out has the ripple effect to teach others. Exactly. Yeah. That's true. And, but... our, and our peers, too. Like, I think, yes. you know, we, we we're all we're all kind of like navigating these like uncertain waters. And, and you see you see other creators trying other things and, and, you know, succeeding or failing at those things. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of people right now are looking at. Mr. Beast, like succeeding with like Feastables or, you know, Prime succeeding and going like, huh, okay. So, mm-hmm. you know, so it's, it's interesting. Like, yeah. But I, I really do feel like we needed to sell our company and have someone else take care of all of the, the company aspects of it while yeah. we focus on the creative. Because in that process, I think that we were, 
kind of subconsciously absorbing the company aspects that the other company was doing while we focus on what we were doing. So now when we approach it, you know, we have learned it. so much of that just by being around it. And you could do it right because you yeah. realize where they've done it wrong. Yeah. Exactly. We let yeah. someone else kind of make the, <laughs> the mistakes, yeah. even though we were part of that and we you know, suffer the consequences of whatever those mistakes were. We now get to approach it having learned from them. And the universe worked out. Yeah, yeah. It worked out. Where would Smosh be today if Rhett and Link never bought it? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, Ian can answer that one. There were there were a couple <laughs> other companies that were looking at it. At like, and, that, and that's where I talked about, like, you know, the uh, realizing the importance of, like, owning your IP because there was one company that was, like, it was, like, a Vietnamese, like, media company <laughs> that just, like, wanted to buy it presumably just to, like, get the press release and that would be enough to just like raise their stock price to make it mm. worth it. They had zero interest in like growing a creator company. They didn't ask those sort of questions. They just knew that they Smosh just, had value. Yeah, the they name. just wanted to buy the catalog and I think that's mm. extremely terrifying mm -hmm. to to be like, okay, like we had at that time, at that point whatever it was, uh 12 years of or yeah, 12 years of content that was like our lives. Those 12 years of our lives and it could have just wound up in someone else's hands, just chopped up content, just distributed on Facebook without our approval. Or locked away. Or and, locked and away. Never yeah. to be seen yeah, again. Like, and so that was like, that was super scary. Um, and that's why I'm super, like, I consider us super fortunate to, Rhett and Link reached out to me and, and were like, hey, what's up? And I was like, <laughs> save us. <laughs> yeah. and, and the fact yeah. that they, they are creators who were our peers and we kind of grew up in this space with them they and they got they, they had very humble beginnings like we did and and because of that they were able to understand where we came from what it was that we wanted to do what we were about so you know of course they they saved smosh from being whatever it would have become otherwise but also when Ian and I came back together and to them and presented this idea of you know we're thinking what it what would it be like if we bought Smosh again. They were completely open to the idea. They were excited about it. They were like, you know, let's talk about the business later. You know, first I just just want to sit here with with this. Just how cool this is for you two to come back mm -hmm. together and want to do this again. Mm -hmm. Again, the fucking universe, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How much you guys buy that back for? That was that ever revealed? No, it no. wasn't. <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> it, it is complicated. But I, I think suffice to say, I think like everybody is happy. So I know it was, it was it was a very it was a very amicable <laughs> great deal I think I think everybody's everybody's gonna be happy but again you're doing business with people who very much understand because they're right there with you mm -hmm. they trailblazed with you they understand what the pressure and stress is associated with doing what you do and I don't like that's you couldn't find a better partner in the two of them I 100 percent agree agree they have such a good understanding of like the creator economy and running a creator business and when they talked to me about buying it, they were like, we don't want to do this without you. It's it's worthless. Well, by the way, a lot of things that they learn probably by watching you all do what you do and navigate this world. Yeah. I, I think that's fair to say. Yeah, I think that we both yeah. learn from each other. But yeah, yeah. no, actually, Cheers. I interviewed them and, and they did say that in the beginnings, they were like, what are these two guys from California doing? <laughs> you know, and they were yeah. kind of looking to our channel to, I, I don't know, to learn something from. Yeah. Yeah. You do good interviews, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah. You too. Well, thanks. I can say that confidently. Yeah. I feel like more people should include you in the list of uh, internet interviewers. Hmm. You know? You're there. I mean, you're, the, you're, you're there, but like, you know, Zane Love, he gets some glory. Sean Evans gets some glory. Nardwar. But where's Anthony Padilla? I don't know. Where's yeah. Anthony Padilla? I'm, I'm right here now. I'm right here. No, I've been jealous of some guests. You interviewed oh, yeah. the conjoined twins. Oh, yeah. That's a fucking <laughs> yeah. big one. Carmen Lupita? Yeah. They're amazing. Icons. They're so great. I watch all their stuff. You have some really good stuff. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. watching the, the Brittany Broski interview. And mm. before I interviewed her, I had to le I learned a thing or two from your interview with oh, her. Th that's very nice. Yeah. That. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, you're not into the pop pop star stuff, not into the pop music stuff? Yeah, I'm into pop star stuff, but you're getting the pop you're getting the you're getting <laughs> the, the pop, pop star stars in. I feel like yeah, you guys yeah. could like swap guests. Like, yeah, you can yeah. give him Ariana. Honestly, he yeah. can give you furries. There Dude, we go. I <laughs> see that. I have <laughs> so many questions for them. And that is, you know, just being honest, like when we've we've been doing this for so long, uh, you know, you get in a not in a rut, but I think like sometimes you just want to do something different, you know? Yeah. Interesting. 
you did something that a lot of people on the internet wouldn't do, and you decided to do interviews, which I commend. You know, a lot of kids who are kids, people, adults, mm -hmm. who are big on the, in YouTube, like a part of the original influencer crowd, you know, they'd get like hosting opportunities or like toy with this idea of doing interviews. And the thing I kept hearing from them is that nobody wanted to not be the star. Like nobody mm. wanted to not be the center of attention. And I just never fully understood or grasped that because, you know, the right interviewer mm -hmm. is around forever, right? The right interview has mm -hmm. the ability to be timeless. And I make the case constantly that even at the end of the world, most likely you're going to receive that information via an interview, mm. right? Yeah. Somebody's going to be asking somebody about it and they're going to be telling you that the world's fucking ending. Right. So the ability to be a great interviewer can last forever. I 100% so agree. I think one of the first podcasts I got into was a comedian because he interviewed somebody that's great. I stopped listening to him because he kept talking about himself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And oh, I was yeah. like, literally, dude, I'm not here for you. <laughs> like, you're here for everybody. But. Yeah, yeah. Not to say, I mean, I think you're great. No, it's not about us. Yeah. <laughs> it's about the people that sit on the but, couch. But uh, yeah, I think I think that's I think that's really good insight. So why do you want to do it? Uh it's funny that you say that because actually part of it was that I wanted the attention off of me. Ah. I, I felt so overwhelmed by the the stress and pressure of living up to what Smosh was that you know while I experimented with I just didn't know what my place was so I experimented with a lot of sketches and I was like okay do I after leaving Smosh I'm like we were known for sketches and we had over 20 million subscribers that's what people want from me that's what I am that's who I am and I was trying to figure out who am I outside of the Smosh guy and at first I thought okay I do sketch comedy as well but it's just it's a completely different brand of sketch comedy it's a little bit like you can't tell if it's real or not it's improvised a lot like so I, I really experimented with that and then I found my footing when I started kind of fucking around and asking people questions in an interview setting and it was like purposely awkward little Nathan Fielder hmm. it was to hide the fact that I was feeling awkward and nervous I was like I'm just an awkward nervous character I'm not actually awkward and nervous in real life but leaning into that and and taking the attention off of me felt like that was a safe place because it wasn't about me. And whenever it was about me, I was, I was awkward and nervous character, but that slowly evolved as I became more confident in what I was doing. I had more confidence in the team that I was building. I knew that the edit would end up amazing, even if I was feeling awkward. So then I actually became more confident because I knew that the team would have it handled no matter what. And that was just a, a slow, gradual process over five or six years of kind of honing in on that and realizing that at, while at first I wanted to take the attention off me and make it about other people, that, that still was the goal, but I also learned a lot about myself and that I liked connecting with people. I liked understanding people. I was very curious about learning about others. And I, uh, through every interview, I felt like I learned something about myself just by uh, learning about all someone time. else. Yeah, that's, well... Yeah, that's the sign of somebody who's doing it right. And I think the other sign of somebody who's doing it right is who, you listen more than you talk. Right. But mm -hmm. people tell, like, they, I get that question all the time. They're like, oh, about your interviews. And I, my answer ends up being, you know, I'm a collection of all the conversations I've had because you end right. up learning so much from talking to somebody for such a, a real amount of time. And in a lot of cases, like, you know, they get emotional. You know, you put yourself into it. And it's, again, like empathy. Mm -hmm. But I think empathy in this situation is only really fueled by things that you've gone through before. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. you've you know, do you feel empathetic? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think that's one of the the biggest draws that I have to doing the interviews. But at the same time, it's also um, the heaviest weight that I hold, and why there there was a period of time where I was doing a lot of dark subjects and talking to people who had experienced dark things. Yeah. And I was holding on to that. I was becoming more depressed in my daily life. Just this constant reminder that the world is horrible and I was holding on to all that. So, you know, while, while I enjoy learning about people and telling their stories and giving them a platform to uh, a place to feel safe in speaking vulnerably about their experiences, I think that is actually what drew me to realizing that while that was a, a very true, real part of me, there was also that side of me that that I was expressing in Smosh, that comedic side, that that side that was just wanted to be completely silly and have fun and forget about the the horrors of the world and and really just just have fun and and laugh and 
that's what's really cool about where we're at now is I get to have both sides of me feel fulfilled. That side of me that is curious and really deeply empathetic and and wants to connect with people. And then I have that side that that Ian and I are are really helming right now as well with Smosh. And it's cool. I get to go back to my roots in a way as well. I didn't realize that this because I kind of felt this emptiness, this void feeling after leaving Smosh. And I felt like I just needed to grow. I need to move forward. I need, needed to move past it and fill that with something else. But that void never went away. And in order for me to feel, feel fulfilled as I do now, a huge part of that was actually going back and returning to my roots, which I thought it was always about moving forward and moving past, you know, what you once were. Oh, it's about reconnecting with your past on your own terms. Yeah. Yeah. And exactly. doing it in a way that makes sense for you in that moment. Mm -hmm. And like something to your point, like what you made earlier is something that will never go away. It's attached to you forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can run or hide from it all you want. It will never go away. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like that, that side of us just naturally expressed itself in a, in a strange sense when we first started making those videos. And I, I think that's kind of the magic and beauty of it all is that there, there was no money to be made. There was no expectation for audiences. You didn't even know that you could go viral. You know, there were very few viral clips that included personalities where they became popular themselves. It was really a lot it's of none. one offs, right? It was just Numa Numa. <laughs> it was all one off and, uh, one off videos, right? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we, we didn't know that we could, because we, we did get our footing with the viral video in 2005. We had no idea that you could take that and continue building that out into something. Yeah, it was like that idea of like the 15 minutes of fame. And mm -hmm. we're like, when is this 15 minutes going to be over? Mm -hmm. how, can we, how can we sustain this? You're still riding it. But you also do life things that like end up fueling this career that you built. You study screenwriting together. You do a lot of things that end up like, end up like fueling the passion that, maybe not stumbled upon, but like sought out because you both needed an outlet. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, yeah, we like, we signed up for screenwriting classes and acting classes and improv classes. Well, we ditched we, all of our other classes. Yeah. We, we, were, <laughs> yeah we, were going to, we were going to community college and we were both like, I was just taking general ed. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, yeah, we but both then, didn't know. <laughs> but then once, uh, once Smosh started going and people started telling us that our, that our acting sucked or that, <laughs> We weren't funny or that we like that are, you know, this, the sketches sucked. We we're like, oh, we, but we can like learn how to do this better. Yeah. You didn't stop. Yeah. You just, yeah. you figured out how to get better. Yep. A we, lot of people did it at community college where it was cheap as fuck. Yeah. Yeah. But, that, but a lot of people would have received that feedback and they would have, you know, bowed out. Yeah. I yeah. I mean, so. it's a blessing and a curse. Um, but I think that if you use it as, uh, fuel or, or something that's exciting to work on, then, then it doesn't feel like a negative. You can't get, yeah. you know, too caught up in, in those comments. I think that like, I think that we had like enough taste to like understand that we could be better. Um, and I think that's probably what drove us to want to take those classes. Cause we, cause we both, you know, enjoyed comedy. We, I think one of our major inspirations was Lonely Island and, you know, seeing them like graduate on to Saturday Night Live and being like, oh, like we could do that too. Like we can, we can create like funny, like music videos and stuff. So I think like we saw, we saw, you know, people that were making awesome stuff and we wanted to get to that level. I will say that, you know, while we did want to work on our acting and, and improve that kind of stuff, I think what our natural inclinations were in terms of the way that we presented our, our characters through the comedy is what set the foundation for what makes Smosh very unique and what makes the, the characters that we, we commonly portray so unique. And, and those weren't things that we learned in any classes. Those were just things that we naturally just kind of felt, felt right. And I think that is what connected or what made people feel connected to or resonated, you know, the, our content resonated with so many people because it was just that natural place that felt right for each of us, which I think is interesting now. It wasn't, it wasn't something that we, we learned in any classes. I think the stuff that we learn in these classes helped us have more range mm -hmm. within that. It helped us know when we could turn that on or off or like have 
uh, a funny moment where there's that juxtaposition between us being extremely silly over the top crazy characters and then there's this moment that's just like too real and like really dark and sentimental and pulls on your heartstrings and all of a sudden we're like these goofy crazy characters again i think it allowed us to have that range but i think the foundation was kind of set just based on what what just felt right between us which is really strange to think back it's like i don't know where that came from what do your dreams look like today as individuals and then as a duo yeah um i don't know if i should start with duo or, or individual um it's kind of hard to say, you know, like, like this is, I think part of what we do in the space that we're in is we kind of have to be willing to kind of go with the flow and, and not get too caught up in this stringent idea of like, this needs to be my goal. Um, so it is very loose, but for me, it's to be able to kind of oversee um, Smosh as a little ecosystem of different channels for all different types of people creating all types of fun videos and new formats and series that um you know bring laughter and joy but at the same time remind people that at the root of it all it is about connecting with with friends and loved ones and sharing a laugh that's that's really what is at the core of all the the smosh channels for the entire brand um and then also personally with my own production company press alike right now it's it's telling stories and, and learning about others and realizing that if you kind of um look pa or get past that initial judgment that that you might feel just that that societal pressure to, to judge this type of person or this thing then you can really learn a lot about yourself and and maybe mm. your loved ones as well it's it's really about you know, connecting with people and then with Smosh, it's, it's connecting with people through laughter. And then with, with this other channel that I'm doing, it's connecting with people through uh, genuine curiosity. And yeah, I want to, I want to continue expanding each of those and seeing how much further we can get with those ideas. And I think like also like with, with your channel, it's about finding people that we see as different, but then when you listen to them, you realize like they're not really different. No, like yeah, and everyone the, is kind of sharing the same sort of human experience. Like, yeah, at all the root of it all. Another, yeah. yeah, at the root of it all, we all have things about us that are so deeply relatable. Well, on the surface, it's like, oh, this person has this career, this person does has this identity that's completely different. But underneath it all, a lot of the most of the times, there's a the reason that they're there is something that's so fundamentally relatable. Uh, yeah, I, dude, we're all different shades of one another. We all have very many threads. That we're pretty us. similar shades. <laughs> I mean, that's cool. <laughs> no, but it is true. I mean, we all have different versions of one another. I mean, however you want to say it, right? Like people are way more alike than they are different, mm -hmm. um, regardless of what people think. Mm -hmm. um, and you do, I mean, a big fan of your guests, you know, mm, people can relate you. to furries. <laughs> now they can. Yeah. 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 <laughs> How about you? Dreams? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, as far as like Smosh goes, like I just... I think it's in such a cool place and just the ability to, to grow it out into something that we see as a sustainable business. Like, you know, the, the dream before was, you know, be a part of something bigger than us, be, you know, with Defy Media, the dream was, you know, eventually like Defy Media will probably sell to a larger media group. And then these shares that we, uh, you know, had in this company will then be worth X amount. Um, and then we don't have to worry, you know, then we can retire at whatever. Um, now I think that the dream is to keep Smosh independent, never sell it, uh, grow it into something that can, that can exist uh, for as long as, as long as we can make it exist. I think. I mean, I'd know, love for it to exist past our lifetime like i think you know like to bring the saturday night live you know thing back lauren michaels i mean that dude is still there um so i think it's yeah it's cool i mean we're we're seeing a new a new generation of uh audience come yeah. in we're seeing a new generation of talent come in um some of our newest talent i'm so stoked about um and it's and it's really cool to see them be a part of this Smosh brand and 
and also help define <coughs> what Smosh could be for years to come. So it's 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 exciting. It's really cool. Um, I just think we're we're so lucky to be able to just have this this like fun place and like and just to be able to like work with people that are excited about like coming to work to just make fun, weird, mm -hmm. cool, crazy shit. Yeah, I love evolving and adapting. And I think that's part of the reason that Smosh has been around for so long is that Smosh as a brand is is constantly evolving and adapting. You know, we've, we've been uh, a channel on YouTube for 18 years and you, you can't just continue creating the same stuff that, that works at one point. You can't just say, okay, we're going to do this forever because that's what we do and, and we're not going to change and, you know, we'll get angry about the changes and we're just going to stick to it though. It's, it really is about that curiosity and, and learning why audiences are wanting certain things and what works and then having new limitations and, and kind of treating it as a playground within those limitations. And I think that's where we thrive. That's why when we first got started with the webcam, we had the limitation of being yeah. stuck to the computer and, um, you know, working within having a playground within that small area there. And, you know, outside of the business elements, I, I like to, to do that for myself as well. I, I love, uh, the idea that, I can spend the rest of my life growing and evolving and adapting and finding excitement in that. I think, you know, the Smosh brand would have died if we would have said this works and we're going to always do this thing and, and screw every indication that uh, we should be changing because audiences are changing. We're just going to keep doing this thing. And I feel like I would have emotionally died as well. Or, totally. you know, if I would have, if I would say, nope, I'm this way forever now, I'm not going to, I'm not going to try growing or learning or being something more. No, just like any other artist, you have to evolve and grow and do things that fulfill you and, and try things, but also like respond and understand where the audience is going. I mean, there is like, but, but also keeping it you like there's, but you can only get there with having a deep understanding of what Smosh is as at its core. Right. So then you mm -hmm. can understand like what makes Smosh Smosh no matter where it may be or what's around it, if that makes any sense. Yeah, and that was the, some some interesting exercises that we did when Ian and I were going in to repurchase Smosh. We wanted to have a, a good idea of what Smosh is, what makes Smosh Smosh, you know. What are the values? What What is it that we want people to take away from it? And, um, you know, we, we realized that our, our sketches, we kind of summed up as joyful absurdity. You know, while it's while it's absolutely absurd, there's always a sense of, of joy there underneath it all. We see Smosh as you know a place to make people laugh and and enjoy uh, comedy rooted in friendship, and um, that's really what it is about at the end of the day. What are you thinking? Well, food battle 2023 is almost yo. Here. Yeah, that maybe. is a few days away. You gotta yeah. understand, like that bonds. Like we have a producer and her and her brother. Like they don't talk, but they talk about food battle. <laughs> 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 are you kidding? <laughs> Yeah, this is yeah. the Super Bowl. Oh, shit. Yeah, well, it was yeah. like revisiting that for the first time in like six, seven years. Oh, um, man, it was so sick. Yeah, I, honestly. It, it's, yeah, it, it, it felt really good to be back. The funny thing is, like, when we, when we made the last food battle in 2016, we were so burnt out of it. Yeah, it and just, I, like, just for viewers that don't know, this is something that we started in 2006 as a one off video. We didn't plan for it to be annual, but because <laughs> Ian was like, yo, we should put 2006 at the end of Food Battle. Because so it, it makes it sound like, more epic. So it sounds <laughs> epic. And then 2007 comes around, people are like, where's two, Food Battle 2007? So it became this annual thing all the way up to 2016. Yeah. And then and then at that point, like I, I feel like our comedy had shifted so much and it just didn't feel natural because we were just so over the top and ridiculous <laughs> and it just didn't really match up with like where the comedy was going but like it really like one of the reasons why we brought why we decided to repurchase smosh and come back together again because it really does feel like that comedy is back to that place mm -hmm. um so yeah we got we got real we got real weird with it we spent so much money on it we went back to sacramento and shot uh at the table that we're always at in my parents, house. parents house like so we like <laughs> flew and drove down the, the whole crew uh up, up to sacramento we shot uh two days there we shot one day here or two days here in la um it was a really big production we're not gonna make the money back but like it doesn't it doesn't matter because like i like the sort of like halo effect 
that like food battle has it's over bigger. Smosh. Like, yeah, it's 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 sort of our flagship uh, event. It's like the the last sort of thing that people have been like demanding from us mm-hmm. since coming back. They're like, we want this thing. We want this thing. When's food battle? When's food battle? When's food battle? So, uh, yeah, um, very excited to to have people check it out. It's clocking in a little over ten minutes. This oh, is our a long one. It's yeah, yeah. This, right this now. is our uh, Killers of the Flower Moon. You know, <laughs> is this is your magnum opus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our yeah, magnum opus. Is, rather, rather than like, yeah, three hours and thirty minutes. Ten minute. A ten minute sketch feels like that. It feels like such an absurd short film in a weird way. <laughs> yeah, there, there's kind of like a, a a serious short film aspect of like the first couple of minutes and the last couple of minutes and everything in between is just absolute absurdity. But yeah, there is something special to be able to watch back all the past food battles to this one to see how they evolve and they get better and they match you where you're at, you know? Yeah, you yeah, and I literally definitely. sat down when we were writing that and we had to go back and watch every single food <laughs> battle, understand every element. We were taking notes yeah. about what worked, what things we wanted to do again, what we wanted to bring back. We took a whole weekend. We we slept over at the studio yeah, and, and just took the whole weekend to like do research on food battle <laughs> food battle then, sleepover weekend yeah and then write and then write the 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 new food battle so yeah it's yeah. it's been a journey i think uh it comes across on screen that we are just so excited about revisiting this franchise and doing it justice that i feel like i cuz i feel like we kind of lost a lot of the passion for it in the 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 final 3 or 2 2 or 3 years uh, so it was really excited to, to bring that excitement and vigor back into yeah. uh, the franchise. Yeah, we just didn't have the time anymore back then. Yeah, yeah, like we, we were so spread thin. Yeah. But also, I started to resent it because people were always like demanding it in this way <laughs> that I felt like I had to. Just, I was just doing it for someone else at some point. So yeah. right now, it it feels like it's it's for the fans, but really for us. It's time. How yeah. do you go about picking your your food for the for the year? Well, we had the we had the the vote the polls. We had. We yeah. had, uh, it's we a opened it up. Process. Yeah. 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 Been going process, on yeah. Since every year, uh, every year since 2009 or 10. Really yeah. Bad. Since 2009, we had, uh, we had polls open for, for two weeks, yeah. uh, with like, uh, so this year it's down, tree. it was down between the pickle and the baguette. Right. So that's, that's what came down the last two. two. People voted. We kept it a secret this yep. whole time. We're already selling merch, but my food on, on all the merch is pixelated and grayed out. So you <laughs> yes. don't know what so it smart. is. Yeah, not so until the, it hits your hits your doorstep. Yep, yeah. but the uh, the reveal is in the video. And we're, we always say, like, you know it's down to two, but you don't know what it's going to be until you watch the video itself. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm, I'm sold. <laughs> it's yeah. absurd. I'm in. We're Do you see hit. yourselves doing this, though, every year now? Or is it just like revisit it for this year and then we'll let it? I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, nice. I I don't know. I I think we'll see how this one goes, and we'll see yeah. if there's still appetite for it. I think, I think, um, yeah, maybe, maybe. I think that's the fun thing about uh, seeing ourselves as constantly evolving and adapting is we're able to say if people want it, I am so down. If they don't, I'm down to try something else too, and I'm excited about both both mm-hmm. options. You two are genuinely. Two of the smartest individuals to ever create mm. things on the internet. No, I do believe that. I do, I do, I do, I do. Dude, like you you were very much ahead of things at a very early time and you set a lot of ground for a lot of people. And you also, to your point, have been able to respond in ways that are very quick and nimble, in ways that big media companies probably can never, right? In terms of like how one responds to audience trends or sure. whatever, right? It, yeah. it mm-hmm. could also be your own inclinations that, you know, drive your creative decisions. You, a big company can never do that. And you've been able to do that time and time again. I mean, it's really impressive shit. Um, how do you define success? Like, re- really, like, what does that actually mean to you today? <sighs> Yeah, you know, I feel like it's easy to get caught up in the idea of success being numbers and growth and milestones and, you know, all these types of things. But I've realized, especially leaving Smosh and and seeing my numbers really, really drop and seeing all these other all these indicators that I would have seen for so long as being a failure, you know, growing from that and starting to be okay in that space made me realize that success to me means accomplishing whatever goal you have. You know, if your goal is hit numbers, yeah, you you may constantly feel like you're you're failing or about to fail, but I shifted my my goals to be um, you know, when I started doing the interview series, it was about telling people stories and making them feel comfortable in that space. So, before the video even dropped, I felt like it was successful. And now with Smosh, I define 
success as creating um, a, a space and creating videos where people really feel like they get to be themselves on camera. The viewer feels like they get to watch someone who they relate to and, you know, they feel like they would love to, to kind of be in the room while this stuff is being made. There's this kind of excitement that that is felt through the screen. And I, to me, I feel like something successful if you've conveyed an emotion through the screen and the viewer on the other side of that screen can feel that. It's special. Do you align with that? Um, if the video hits one out of 10, <laughs> then there you go. No, uh, one million the first day. Yeah. yeah. Success- one million the first day. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, that's what we used to do. Like where it was like, yeah, this is like a number thing. I think, I think like I, I see success as like, it, it's like, uh, like a long-term thing. Like, like success isn't having one video pop off. I think success is like, the team is excited about the direction. There's like people that are that are winning in other parts of of the team. Um, yeah, I'd say it's really cool when we when we uh, kind of have a little watch party mm-hmm. of like the newest uh, series or format or or show yeah. or video that we just created, and the whole team's there watching it, yeah. and everyone's getting excited, everyone's laughing. When that big moments, there's there's you know, people are clapping and wooing and there's this excitement that's felt in the room. And that I feel like that's how I know when there's a successful moment. Mm -hmm. And I think seeing and feeling that energy in the room, uh, it it pretty closely aligns with, with what people feel when they're, they're, you know, at home on their computers or on their phone watching this stuff as well. Yeah. I think like a good example is we started this sort of pitch process at our company that incentivizes uh, other people in the company to pitch like a like a series idea um, to kind of s- somebody, tap into their creative side. Yeah. It's, it's really yeah. cool. So somebody in our production team suggested this this food show because we've been trying to we 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 try to provide people like a like a like an idea of what we're looking for and well that pitch, limitation that has always yeah, worked for pitch us pitch within that pitch within that sort of box. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we had this this guy in our production team pitch this uh, show called uh, Culinary Crimes. Shout out, Marcus. Which is like a, uh, it's like this sort of like, it's set up like almost like a noir detective kind of set. <laughs> and they go into like Reddit, uh, like it's like Reddit recipes where like people took a food, took a recipe, but they didn't have an item. So they substitute it with something else that's like fucked up <laughs> and so uh, it's a lot of like people leaving reviews for the food for yeah. the recipe and they're like oh i tried this but i didn't have this so i swapped this with this and you know it it sucked yeah so we, <laughs> we blank out like some of the key words and then we have the food there we have like a like a chef prepare the food as that person made it oh, that's fun um and then they taste it they try to guess what it was that was substituted there's a whole bunch of things in in the uh the original comments about it that are redacted oh, that's yeah. so, good. The, so the guests and, and our host courtney they try to guess what the redacted words were what was replaced yeah. and they're it's it's all kind of in this this space where they're role playing as detectives trying to figure this out. Yeah. And uh one one of the one of the foods was uh banana bread and they're like it it tastes like the, it it's fine it tastes like a chocolate kind of cake or something. Uh it turned out the person had substituted uh sour milk for uh orange juice. Ew. Yeah, but, but they were fine. they it were pissed because fine. it actually tasted okay. <laughs> yeah, and that was the biggest that was the biggest thing because they're they're supposed to give a sentence yeah. at the end for what they would charge this person and this one they said was a mistrial because good. They, yeah. they said they were just pissed about how that it was still good that yeah. it still worked somehow. So we held like a little like watch party, brought everyone in the company together to like watch the first episode and and uh, first episode's doing really well. I think it's over 500k and, mm-hmm. and the audience is really jazzed about it. We're already shooting more episodes. And we're getting uh, more creative and, and leaning in even deeper into this film noir kind of crime scene. Almost like, I, I want 
a lot of it to, to feel like, and when I'm talking with the team, I'm like, think like it's almost uh, like a true crime, like Netflix documentary, show. true crime. But it's like even even though it's all about food, and it's yeah. we're leaning super deep into that. It's fun. By the way, we'll put a link in the description below. You should watch it. Oh hell yeah, sure. Uh, I was say, speaking of success in food, do you wish Beef and Go wasn't your most viewed video? <laughs> <laughs> that was a complete yeah. fluke. That, that, that video popped up. 108 million views. Do, on do that you know thing. the story about how that got so so many views? No. Oh um, god. So well, there there is a very unfortunate uh, thumbnail. That was, uh, it was an accident because at that time with YouTube, you couldn't choose your thumbnails. Yeah, yeah you couldn't choose a thumbnail for the first three years of YouTube. <laughs> so whatever was the middle frame. Yeah. Perfect and, middle frame. And it was um, a censored picture of uh, Britney Spears' for JJ. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, she was getting out of a car. It was like a it's famous, a famous oh, photo. Sure. And we but like they, referenced it in the video, but it happened to be right in the middle yeah. of the video. And that was the thumbnail. So the joke was like, video. everyone loves it. Even celebrities. And we're like, like, look, even, you know, this celebrity loves it, this celebrity. And it just so happened to be that moment. And that's that we, how it has so many views. And that's yeah. where, and it's funny if you look at the demographic, you see where the type a lot of, of person old men from Saudi Arabia. It's like sixty plus, <laughs> sixty plus year old men watching this with thing. the title "Beef and Go." <laughs> yeah. 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 What do you think they're thinking? Yeah. That's a decently long video. They're yeah. looking for something so unintentional. It's fucked yeah. up. I don't think there was much like audience retention. With yeah, that yeah. Video. I'm, I'm guessing they left after two yeah. seconds. But it's just interesting though. Like that, I mean, you probably gained <laughs> some audience from just that fluke. No? Probably, probably. There, there was a, a small group of people. Yeah, we we gained an audience from that. Which I is watched so Beef and Go this morning on my way in. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, you're like, what's the most viewed video? I know. That's I, the only I, reason see, I, I feel like that's. I feel it's like not that's the most viewed though. Yes, it is. It it's is. most popular. It's 108, 108 million. Yeah, uh, I knew it was that's yeah. the only reason that I'm like, God damn it, this video. This is what everyone, when they're gonna do something with us, they watch yeah. to understand us. You know, it's it is like a blessing and a curse because I feel like a lot of people that like discover us you know the typical thing is if you see a new channel you're like oh i'll go to the most popular videos because it's be the, the most best successful one have you it's thought about best. taking it down <sighs> no it's got 108 million views you gotta take that <laughs> yeah, down we, we, we might want to just like unlist it or something because <laughs> the second video the second most viewed video is a banger yeah assassin's um, creed 3 yeah, yeah. you know what's third is Zelda and there's a live action Zelda. That's right, Ian. That's right. Yeah, they Put your name in the hat. If hit that's me up. True, it no. might be time to make a sequel to that video. I'm I'm waiting for the the Half Life uh, live action. Oh you shit! Know, he I, looks I like could, I could be Gordon Freeman. Gordon Freeman. <laughs> Very Gorman Freeman co coded. Yep. What have you learned about each other from this second <laughs> Smosh chapter or whatever you would describe it? This re rekindling or resurrection or I don't know. One thing that stands out to me is how much Ian was forced to step up into the leader position because um you know for so many years as we were working together you know ian was really like go with the flow and that's where we actually excelled was that dynamic between us mm -hmm. was i would take a little bit more of the leadership role a little bit more like rigid like get this thing done figure out this thing i have this this to-do list and these goals and like i was kind of doing that kind of thing all the programming and stuff while ian was a lot more uh focused on just being creative and shooting out ideas and that's where i think the dynamic between us really flourished but now, you know, I've kind of been because I was I've been off, off off on my own. I've been forced to kind of hone in on that creative go with the flow side while Ian's been forced to hone in on that that leadership uh, mentality. And and I think it's really cool to uh, to see that side of, of, of both of us yeah. flourish. Yeah. I mean, it was it was a lot of it was a lot of like difficult years of like having to try to redefine what Smosh was post Anthony and, and trying to like help the audience understand like, Oh, there's like, there's, there's all these people that are also Smosh. So that, that's, that was like, that was definitely like a struggle for me, but now I can kind of like, now I can kind of like, look, you know, like, I feel like my, my skills have been kind of like forged in fire of like making so many mistakes and, <laughs> and blunders along the way. But now I feel like I have like a, a pretty decent understanding of like you know the sort of employee employer relationship <laughs> was any part of you resentful when anthony left and you were kind of forced to do this on your own um yeah i mean there was definitely an amount of resentment for sure i think i think it was like it it was just it was just like the feeling of like i'm getting thrown in the deep end of the pool and nobody's um, there with you. And nobody's there. And like I and there was not much time to prepare for it because we didn't want to spoil 
Anthony leaving. So I couldn't well, we really... were told that we couldn't tell. Yeah. Like by the company, we were told that we, we had to keep it under wraps. So it was like... Even within the company. Yeah. So it was like we announced that Anthony was leaving and then it was like, now I got to figure this out. So it there was, there was definitely like this scramble. And then also like being like a leader in the company was not something that I desired. Totally. It was kind of like, if not me, then who? It's true. So it was just kind of like... Fuck, I guess I gotta adapt or be, die. Be, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just like I'll stick it out, <laughs> you know, like because I I I really believed in like Smosh and and I believe there's still so much more potential there. So I wasn't I wasn't ready to leave it. I wasn't necessarily like happy with like the position that I was put in. Um, but I saw so much more potential and and growth there that I wasn't willing to like let it go just yet. Mm -hmm. And now that we're in this place, you know, we, we, we hired on a CEO that was Anthony's business partner. Um, we have a, a great head of production. We have these, these people that are in these places that are, that are calling the shots that I have no business calling, um, that I feel like they're better off in those places than, than I am so that I could focus on, on the things that I'm good at. Any part of you grateful for being put into that position to begin with? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. I mean, like, I guess, like, you know, you 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 do pick up like skills. I guess I I think I was I was really unhappy for for a certain amount of time. Um, so I mean, I don't know if it's like if it's healthy to say like. You know, I'm glad that I like suffered through this because I'm stronger because of it. Because I don't. I don't know if that's I don't know if that's true, but I think that I am grateful that I stuck it out because I think I think that I was right that there was that Smosh meant a lot to a lot of people and that there was still a lot of potential. That's why I stuck around and now we're seeing that's true. And yeah. like we're seeing all this like all this like weird stuff happen where like uh, somebody sent us a clip from uh, Hassan Piker's stream of Young Gravy and Baby No Money talking about Smosh, <laughs> and we we're like, "What?" And they like grew up like watching Smosh. Yeah. And so and so we're like, "Well, should we like try to get him in a video?" Like, yeah. I think it's like I think it's I think it's wild because it's like yeah, Gen Z grew up watching Smosh. Like Gen Z knows about Smosh, so it's like now that Gen Z's coming up into these places. Um, it's like, yeah, here we are. Let's, let's make some fun, cool stuff. Yeah. And I, I really respect, uh, Ian pulling Smosh through all the, just so many years of, of all that, that difficulty, kind of like trudging through this, like this swamp with this, uh, with this company and, and turning it and uh, keeping it alive, keeping it thriving, creating new formats and shows and highlighting the the cast and um you know growing it into what it became when when I decided that you know it was it was time we we could we could do this again and i think in the final years of me being at smosh i started to resent everything i started to resent um you know the parent company and kind of what smosh what they turned smosh into and how Ian and i lost our our friendship uh in some ways because of it but also because of ourselves. And I think because I, in, in part of that, because I was, was resenting Ian in, in part of that, I think I, I forgot to, um, to really respect and honor the, the work that Ian had put into it. And I think part of me, because I felt like so much of it was out of my control and, you know, I, I felt like if it was all in my control, I, I, this would have been fine. You know, it's kind of a story that I built in my head. So I think I started to resent Ian and the the way that the the company had went. So it it was really cool to to be watching from a distance and and as I started to reconnect with Ian and, and everything to to kind of start to understand the mindset that he had, why he stuck around, what he had built it into, and you know growing into this leadership position and taking all these roles on that he didn't want, and you know all these positions that I felt like I was thrown into. Ian was now. Um, being thrown into because I don't think that I wanted to be a leader so much, but I just found myself in that position, and I think I was frustrated about that to a to a certain degree because I, you know, kind of 
dealt with that in my childhood too, of like being thrown into um, kind of feeling like I had to take on more responsibilities than I wanted to at a very young age. I so, can imagine. So I, yeah, so I felt like I, I um, dealt with that with Smosh to a certain degree. And uh, I think that part of me was trying to like have Ian be like uh, co-running it entirely, like 50-50. And I got in my head like, it needs to be 50-50 because I think that I wanted that uh, kind of in my childhood home. So, um, you know, because Ian was so much more focused on being more creative and, and in many ways keeping Smosh fun, which I feel like is, is at the heart of Smosh, um, I think a part of me resented Ian for not taking on that leadership role with me as, as much. Mm. And I think, you know, one element of us reconnecting is, is Ian really has taken on that, that leadership role. And I don't feel like it's on my shoulders anymore, um, to that same degree. And Smosh, you know, Ian kept Smosh alive and thriving for six years while I was gone. I don't feel now like it's hanging on by a thread that I'm holding yeah. on to. It feels like it, it can live and thrive on its own and that Ian's there to to back me up whenever I need it. Did you carry most of the responsibility growing up at home? Um, I wouldn't say most of the responsibility, but there was a, a large amount of responsibility thrown on my shoulders. Um, you know, I talk about this a lot, but uh, because my mom has agoraphobia, she she does rely on someone else to to uh, you know get the groceries and take care of the household in many ways. And uh, when my and you brother, were the older brother, too. and I was the oldest child, and uh, my brother's dad, my I have two uh, half brothers, and their dad was living with us and taking care of a lot of those responsibilities. But he bailed, and the responsibility then fell on me at, uh, at like at twelve and a half, thirteen years old. So I felt like I didn't want to be in this position of, of, uh, whatever that was, just all that responsibility was too much for me. And I think I can kind of accidentally found myself in this place where I felt like this company, um, the responsibilities was on me. And if it, if it went out of control, it was, it was, on all, you. It was all on me. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of weight to carry. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I think that's a, a big part of the reason why. I feel so much better about where Smosh is now and why everything needed to happen in order for it to get to where it is now is I don't feel that burden element of it now. I just feel like the excited element of it. What has your mom taught you about other people? Um, I mean, a huge part of my process in the past six years has actually been understanding my mom and where she came from and why she is the way she is, why um, you know, the traumas that that she's dealt with in her life and her childhood and her the way she was raised by her parents and the things that were thrown at her, um, you know, how all that led to agoraphobia and how it led to her feeling like the only place that is safe is her home. And I resented that for a while, too, because I felt like because of that, because my mom wasn't pushing through that, all all of the extra weight, all that extra burden was thrown onto me instead because she didn't want to deal with the stuff that when I was younger, I was like, oh, uh, a parent should deal with this stuff so that their child doesn't have to. And now I'm I'm able to so much more um, easily understand why someone can end up that way, have empathy for them. I have a lot more empathy for my mom. I've connected with her so much more deeply, just understanding why she is the way she is and, um, you know, how she doesn't want it to be this way, you know? And um, I think for a long time, I felt like she just w didn't care if it was or wasn't this way. She mm -hmm. wanted it to be this way almost. And, um, so, so now I'm able to understand others and doing my interviews, uh, has, has been a part of that process and understanding others. And, um, I think the interviews that I was doing, um, for so many of the years was kind of leading up to me understanding my, my mom better and understanding totally. why I am the way I am as well. Do you remember the moment you realized you weren't going to end up like your mom? Uh, Hmm. I, I don't think there was a moment for me to really ever take that in, but I think that was part of the reason I became so fully entrenched in my work was I felt like if I was always working on something, then I wouldn't be at the risk of being agoraphobic and, and letting anxiety control my entire life. It's hard. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. a, you can look at that and go, Maybe a part of that is the reason for your success, right? To get so well, deeply entrenched. It is. And that's that's the the, the gift the and the curse. Edged sword. Yeah. Is uh, you know, with all the the pain that I was dealing with, uh, I think that I threw myself into my work to escape that pain. And I guess, you know, part of the reason that that we are where we are now and 
Smosh is what it is. And um, just so much of this has become what it is, is because of that pain, you know? So when you are able to zoom out and look at it with that perspective, I think it does help uh, in, in any given moment, the pain that you're experiencing to know that as much as you don't want this to happen, as much as maybe it shouldn't happen, there will be a point where you can realize that there was something that you learned from it, whatever that might be, some way that it affected your life. You know, life is a constant up and down. It's it's not going to be a constant growth, and you need to experience those downs in order to uh, to to go even further. Does your mom fully understand what you do? Yeah, yeah, I talk about it deeply with her. I mean, I don't think she she understands all the ins and outs, but she, she, she understands it. I could talk with her about most elements of it and she'll ask a question if she doesn't get it. She wants to understand and she, she does understand most of it. Do you think she's proud of you? Oh yeah. I mean, she said it many times. Um, when, uh, when we, when we dropped by his house, she was wearing a small shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was, a, uh, we were back in Sacramento shooting a uh, food battle and Ian, uh, dropped by for a quick moment. Hadn't, yeah. hadn't seen her in God, probably 10 years. Yeah. A long time. Yeah. She, she put on her smosh shirt the, we made this little <laughs> reunion shirt, uh, celebrating Ian and I returning together to own smosh. And she was, uh, proudly wearing that, that shirt. It's really special. Yeah, it was and really cute. Are your parents still in Sacramento too? Yeah. That's so crazy. Yeah. yeah. Our whole yeah. family's in Sac. Yeah. <laughs> That's wild, dude. Yeah. yeah. Like, so, you know, it, it, it could be a fun excuse, you know, shooting food battles up in the original location. <laughs> just visit family and, and yeah. kind of visit our hometown. And we put my mom back in the back in food battle. Good. Yeah. She always says she hates being in the videos, but she's so good at it. Yeah. <laughs> she, she really, like, doesn't like... It, I think it's, like, the pressure of, like, being on camera because she's, like, afraid that she can't, like, nail her lines. But, like, every time my mom's in a video, it's it's such a banger. Yeah. Like, we so can't funny. not put her in. Yeah. You guys are really special. I think you're you. special. You're special. Mm, okay. Thank <laughs> you for taking the time. I really appreciate this very, very much. It's really, it's, um, yeah, you guys are really fascinating and very, very layered, but very much this beacon of fucking like what the internet could be and has been. And you really shed a lot of light on a lot of things for a lot of people. Mm. And to get a better understanding of exactly what one has to go through in order to provide examples or like just a cautionary tales for others is, uh, it's refreshing and eye opening. Yeah. Thanks well, thank for having you, us on. I appreciate you. Thank what are you, you thinking? Though. The last question I have is, uh, what's the biggest challenges between making videos in 2023 compared to 2013? Cause you could get away with a lot more back then. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, you definitely <sighs> have to worry about like certain, like, uh, monetization issues, I guess. Mm -hmm. We would, like, in 2013, like, every video had us ending with us shooting somebody. Yeah, there was a lot of guns back then. There was, was a gonna... lot of guns. Because it was like, oh, that's funny. Then he gets, like, shot, or he gets, like, robbed, and he gets stabbed. Yeah. And, like, and like we still find ways of enacting violence on each other, but it's got to be a lot more, um, it's like, oh, I guess, like, we can't, like, show, like, a gallon of blood, like, dump out of this guy. It's more Im implied, and um, I think there's a fun element to it. <laughs> I mean, it forces us to be more creative. Like we, because we had this literal. Dis we we still have these discussions where, like, oh yeah, old Smosh, we would have just shot a guy here, um, but that's just like not chill anymore. Um, <laughs> so it's unfortunately like too real now. So it's like, yeah, yeah it's America. Yeah, people weren't getting shot in 2013. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, sometimes working within those limitations actually provides us with uh, a funnier idea. Totally. Yeah. You know, um, one million. Percent. You know. Yeah. So now he gets stabbed. You know. Yep. <laughs> it's different. Yeah. By the way, you can obviously subscribe to Smosh if you aren't already, but I'm assuming that you're an internet person because you're watching this maybe on YouTube or TikTok or whatever. Just go uh, subscribe. Pretty wild, though, to rationalize the fact that there's a whole other generation that didn't know you before now learning exactly who and what Smosh is, but from a whole different perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, it, that shocks, like, at least for our show, it shocks me every day yeah. when young people, like, cause, you know, you, you expect that, like, everybody's kind of your age, you know, sure. to yeah. a certain degree, or at least when you start, like, that's how I viewed it solely. Like, I was making, like, I was just looking for fucking friends. So, mm -hmm. like, I would assume that the people are close to my age. But then when I meet, like, 12 year olds or like 16 year olds or 15 year olds who've been like, oh, I've been watching you or listening to you since I was a child. Yeah. It yeah, changes yeah. this whole. For sure. It's weird. Yeah. yeah, I mean, or often. people that didn't even know Anthony. That's like, crazy because they tuned in and became a Smosh <laughs> fan at a moment where you weren't around. Yeah. That is, and they're all yep. younger Gen Z, Gen Alpha, whatever. Yep. 
Exactly. Yeah, I mean, sometimes we'll have someone come up to us and be like, oh my God, I used to watch you since I, when I was eight. And they're like, they have like a full blown beard and a child yeah. now. It's yeah. <laughs> are you surprised at all that you that what you do still applies to people who are half your age? I'm surprised any of what we do resonates. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, I, I think that we've never tried to like go after a specific demographic. And I think like, comedy is is pretty universal and i mean i think it's like a lot of our a lot of our situations are very like relatable to to all ages you know so. yeah i mean part of the joy of creating the the sketches specifically is catching people off guard yeah. and yeah i think as long as we stay up on the lingo <laughs> no cap no cap though yeah. <laughs> dead ass mm. Riz. no uh, that's already that's our, all the all those all those are dead now yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's like all about skibbity yeah skibbity toilet yeah cool no but that's old now too if you can change one thing about the internet what would it be oh um i oh 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 yeah one million percent no family channels okay got mm -hmm. it I, I i support that mm -hmm. no i agree <laughs> <laughs> what is it about family channels you're not into? Just the whole idea of it? Exploitation. Children don't have consent. And it mm -hmm. is never what it looks like on the fucking surface. No. That shit is always somebody, gnarly. And somebody was just telling me there's like this, there's like this platform. It's it's not only fans, but it's like a similar thing. And family channels are like using it and like posting like exclusive content with their kids for their like oh, audiences. That. That's weird. And there's just there's no regulation. And just on like that. Yeah. In the year twenty twenty three, CPS is a whole <laughs> new fucking fish to fry. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I think if if I was younger now and my parents had me in their vlogging channels and, and shit like that, Smosh wouldn't be a thing huh? because going into creating your first videos, people already have an idea of who you mm -hmm. are. Who's and, your individual? Right, right. You are not you don't get to create your own uh persona that you present. To the internet, it's already been presented for you. By the way, people who do that, you're taking that away from your children. You're taking away their ability to f discover and find out who they are as a person. You're removing their autonomy. Without the I lens, dude. I think that they don't care. No, they don't. And that's what's really sad and scary. And that goes back to, you know, some people just shouldn't be allowed to have children. On that note, you should uh, subscribe to the Smosh account. We're going to put a link in the description below. Final thought. I just respect that you have not rebranded. You just keep the logo the same. Yeah, fuck it. I made yeah. that yeah. thing. I made that thing for the website in 2002. Not even for a YouTube channel, not for anything else. I was 14 years old Dude. tinkering and, around with that little thing. And we tried. We've actually we've <laughs> actually run this exercise like multiple times when Anthony was not around to try to like to rebrand <laughs> from to rebrand and it just always looks like ass. <laughs> like there's no there's no way to like 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 modernize that that shitty logo dude when just... i was 14 i made the most genius shitty logo <laughs> so it's gonna stay a genius <laughs> shitty logo forever yeah. but that's yeah. how you know like if it's really not broken you can't find a fix to it yeah. so that's right it that's what i'm saying it's timeless and i genuinely and deeply respect your uh mission to make smosh something that lasts way beyond the both of you because i think you know not all internet creators understand that what what one creates, every interview, every video, every whatever you put out there, is genuinely bigger than one person. And the impact that that one thing has on the larger world, the zeitgeist, whatever you want to call it, is kind of immeasurable. And uh, to think that it's just because of you or it dies with you is rather selfish, in my opinion. Hmm. Because there is an ability to – you've built something so big and – meaningful Thank to you. so many so yeah i mean Thank it's you. really cool when when people tell us that it made such an impact and it'd be it'd be cool to to know that that continued and you know that 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 moment of like in the office having the watch party with everyone who worked on something and being able to see it come to life and see all the excitement and feel all of that in the room it'd be cool you know hundreds of years in the future people are still having sharing this really fun moment of creating something and laughing together but they all last forever like that stuff will last in circulation in on platforms within whatever algorithm the uh, on, attached to whatever platform comes next forever yeah i mean it, it is so. it, it is it's wild you know i remember when we first started uploading those the very very earliest videos on youtube and you could see the little thing right there that said uploaded three weeks ago then i saw it uploaded four weeks ago then it's one month ago i was like 
Ooh, this is for some reason in my head I started getting this really big idea and zooming way out. I was like, dude, that's gonna be fucking crazy when this says uploaded ten years ago. <laughs> yeah. But now it's like, you know, yeah. in a couple of weeks, some of our videos are gonna say uploaded eighteen, 18 years, years ago. ago. Yeah. And it's crazy to think that this stuff is just gonna last at one point it'll say uploaded one hundred years ago. <laughs> well, Come let's out. hope YouTube stays around that long. Hey, you know, we gotta, it, we gotta start digitizing. YouTube's all got of our some content. longevity though, for real. Fingers and toes, man. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations to the two of you. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you for your time and energy today. Thank you. It Thank really you. was a pleasure. I can't believe you even wanted to come here, said oh, yes yeah. to coming here. No, dude, I love I love your show. I told you, you know, before some of my interviews, I'm jumping in to see the conversations you have with people, make sure I don't double up on them, but also get some uh, little seeds for fun topics. Well, I appreciate you giving us any time and energy. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Real recognizes real, so... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You good? We took up too much of their time. <laughs> yeah, you gotta get the fuck out of here. Smosh everybody. Sorry. Let's Thank go. You. Woo. <laughs>